So hello everyone and welcome to our last session of this two-day event entitled The Lexicon of Decoloniality in Eastern Europe. My name is Anna Vilenica, I'm the editor of The Lexicon and I will be the moderator of this event. Uh, I'm overjoyed uh, to have the chance to host uh, this amazing group of uh, people and thinkers uh, and contribute with this event to ongoing discussions on colonialism, anti-colonialism and decoloniality in Eastern Europe. The idea for this event emerged from necessity to confront neo-colonial mainstream, but also activist, artistic and cultural politics and practices that we have been encountering in our work. There have been many recent events and publications worldwide about colonialism, new colonialism, anti-colonialism and horizontal decoloniality in Eastern Europe. This conversation demonstrated, among other things, the difficulties in translating terminology made available by post-colonial studies of European empires to local context, making apparent the necessity of inventing new concepts that speak to local situation. The lexicon in progress aspires to derive meaning from referring to local East European experiences and creating from them an index of reference that can assist in future criticism debates and practices. To get this process underway, we have invited 16 contributors taking an active part in these discussions. They have suggested 16 notions they found constructive in these conversations. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank Huda Org from Novi Sad for trusting this idea and for making this possible for all of us. Um, in the first session of the day, uh, we heard from Manuela Boace, Boana Videkanić, Obidiu Tishendalianu, Čarna Brković, and Čarna Brković, uh, we talked about uh, unequal Europe's uh, non-aligned modernisms, intimate colonization and humanitarianism from perspective of uh, non-alignment and from perspective of Europeanization. Uh, so in our last session, uh, you will hear from four amazing speakers that I will now introduce to you in order of appearance. So our first speaker uh, is uh, Zoltan Ginelli, uh, that, uh, uh, whose work I was following in the last years and who is the creator of the Facebook, Facebook group from which we all kind of like learned a lot, connected uh, and uh, I want to use this chance to thank him for all of his work on this uh, uh, topic so far. So Zoltan is a critical geographer and global historian whose research focuses on the relations between Eastern Europe and the Third World and Hungarian connections to colonialism, anti-colonialism, decolonization and race. He co-curated with Esther uh, Sokac uh, the art and documentary exhibition project Transperiphery Movement, Global Eastern Europe and Global South, and established the Decolonial Eastern Europe Group. Currently, he is writing two books, uh, his own monograph on the global histories of the quantitative revolution geography, and co-authored book with James Mark and Peter Apor for Cambridge University Press about modern era Hungarian relations to colonialism and anti-colonialism until present times. Our second speaker is uh, Lukas Stanek, uh, who is a professor of architectural history at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Uh, Stanek authored Han Han uh, Han Oh my God, like uh, after like the second event, I, I cannot speak uh, English anymore. I apologize. Uh, and Henry Lefebvre on space architecture, urban research and the production of theory published by University of Minnesota Press in 2011, and Ar Architecture in Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and the Middle East in the Cold War, by, published by Princeton University Press in 2020. He is con currently a senior fellow at the University of uh, Ghana uh, at uh, Ligon in Accra, at the Maria Sibylle Marian Institute for Advanced Studies in Africa, uh, and he is uh, uh, checking in uh, from Accra today. Uh, our third speaker is uh, um, a, a dear uh, friend and comrade, Erin McElroy, uh, with whom I share a Radical Housing Journal. Erin uh, is an assistant professor of American studies at the University of Texas at Austin and is co-founder of the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, a counter cartography and digital media collective that produces maps, tools, and stories to support the work of housing justice. 
Erin's research focuses on the intersection of gentrification, technology, data, property, and empire, particularly regarding contexts of radical dispossession and siliconization in the San Francisco Bay Area and in Romania. <clears throat> Erin is also an editor of the Radical Housing Journal, an open access journal that brings together housing organizers and researchers transnationally. And our fourth speaker uh, is uh, also my dear friend and, and comrade Veda Popovici that is uh, checking in from uh, the meeting of the European Action Coalition for Right to Housing and the City from Brussels. Uh, Veda is a political uh, artist, engaged theorist, and local activist. Her political work developed on housing struggles and communitarian organizing as, as part of Makaz Cooperative, the Common Front for Housing Rights, and the Gazette of Political Art. <clears throat> After finishing her PhD on nationalism in Romanian art of the 1980s, she has taught classes on decolonial thought, nationalism, and feminist theory at the National University of Arts in Bucharest and at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is based in Bucharest. So uh, I, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. Um, and uh, before I give a word uh, to our guest, I would just uh, like to encourage the audience uh, to use uh, a chat function for their questions and comments, and I will deliver them to our speakers uh, later in the Q&A session. Um, so we will have a Q&A session uh, like in the previous uh, two sessions. The, the first part will be a conversation uh, between uh, our participants, uh, and the second part will be uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, so uh, Zoltan, um, Zoltan is checking in uh, from uh, Hungary. Uh, please, uh, um, the floor is yours. Uh, um, and uh, we are all looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, transcoloniality, uh, the notion that uh, you chose to present. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation and I hope you can hear me. Okay, so all is good. Uh, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here uh, amongst all these very influential uh, figures, uh, many of whom uh, I know personally and I've been influenced strongly uh, by Shrongi. Here I'll be talking about transcoloniality, which has been a concept I've been working with or towards. It is about how various colonial positions and contexts are spatially entangled, interwoven and interconnected in global history. So how colonial positions and subjectivities change and translate through these uh, trans-regional traces between these contexts. Here I will focus on Hungarian colonists in South America uh, and also we'll try to connect uh, parts and pieces to Jewish coloniality in relation to Eastern Europe. Uh, I'd like to refer to three points one is my own book, which is about the global histories of the quantitative revolution. It's in uh, production, uh, which is about the mathematical theories of uh, planning settlements and the regions applied in the Nazi Generalplan Ost, so in Eastern Europe, which were reused by Polish geographers in the post-war regional reorganization of Poland and taken via the Americanized networks within uh, the African decolonization to make for example, the regional development plan of Baghdad. So you could see these examples of trans-regional trace, uh, traces of colonial, which I'm focusing on, but I also like to refer to the work of Manuela Boatka and uh, Anka Parwescu. Uh, uh, Manuela spoke in the previous session, their uh, forthcoming book, Realizing Transylvania, uh, and their work on inter-imperiality, how Transylvania is at the intersections, of, was at the intersections of a series of empires, and about this inter-imperial positionality linked to the coloniality of empire in the European semi-periphery. And lastly, uh, Lukas uh, Stanek will be speaking about socialist world making, but also his work and his book is connected to how Eastern European experiences of coloniality were translated in the uh, post-colonial context of Africa or West Asia, for example. Okay, so I'll try to talk about geography and the geographical approach to coloniality 
because I sense there's a lack of awareness, lack of geographical awareness and sensibility of colonialisms. So whose coloniality, what coloniality and where are we speaking about? It's a rather difficult question because of the complicated uh, overlapping and tangible and contradicting or even antagonistic colonial projects. So one might be in the position, in the position of the colonizer, but on the other hand, or from another perspective, that figure or, or, or uh, agent could be, or actor could be the, the colonized, colonizer or colonized. These uh, ma various material, these materializations of coloniality uh, come in different types and forms, but often uh, there are particular colonialisms which are prone to be essentialized or even played out against each other. So colonial histories have been captured by national histories and also by various national victimizations in memory politics. And quite recently in Hungary, since 2012, colonization, colonial victimization discourse uh, developed by the Orban uh, government is a prime example, saying that we will not be the colonies of the West. So I think transcoloniality will problematize this colonizer colonized dichotomy why it is an inadequate to understand global colonial history and try to understand these longer term histories of this positioning game of uh, who is the colonizer, the colonized. And uh, I think that the recent discourses, we never had colonies in Eastern Europe is a false territorial understanding uh, since global colonialism was a trans-regional project. So how Hungary was entangled in and spatially integrated to global colonialism based on its semi-peripheral structural integration, I think is the key question to ask against both Eastern European exceptionalism, discourses also West-centric frames of adapting post-colonial studies, or we recently mentioned Black Lives Matter uh, as an activist framework or their conceptions of colorism or what, it does, what race means is largely West-centric. And also I find inadequate leftist criticism of white supremacy and fascism as a case of Eastern European uh, conceptions of race, raciality, and also colonialism, because they, um, I think, not uh, deeply, uh, not uh, deeply enough understand the semi-peripheral structural stakes of this in-between positioning in terms of race and coloniality. Okay, uh, so let's turn to my empirical example. Uh, first I start, this is a long shot, but starting with, the, uh, turning to the history of Hungary and the colonial history of Hungary to be exact, and looking at the Ottoman occupation from the mid 16th century, which is often deemed as colonial in Hungarian history. But the product of this was uh, uh, in, from the 17th century onwards, an internal colonization of the Hungarian kingdom, which created a multi-ethnic space of the Habsburg Empire in the territory of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Here on the map, you can see settlements, the planned settlements, which were often made uh, based on uh, previous practices and examples of American, North American frontier, uh, colonial frontier. Uh, but an interesting example is that one of the people who came here were the Swabian Germans. So the Southern uh, uh, Germans who were populated in, and settled in, often in a planned way in this area due to German hegemony. And they maintained their language and identity due to this German, uh, ongoing German hegemony in the region. This is strongly connected to uh, Manuela's and uh, Anka Parvescu's work, which I mentioned. Uh, you could see the places, the regions they settled. Uh, these are the post trianon Treaty borders. You could see those, so you could see smaller Hungary. And you can see that today, uh, these are the regions of Romania, Serbia too. And, and why this will be very interesting is because due to, uh, uh, due to German, uh, so these Germanic populations became subject to uh, late coming colonial desires of the modern German empire. 
which then culminated in the Nazi Third Reich's imperialist agendas and colonial expansionism, the Lebensraum, the Grossraum concepts towards Eastern Europe. Uh, and ultimately the racial extermination program of the Slavs and not just the Jewish populations uh, which live in this area, in the Generalplan also. Now in the interwar era, the German geographers map and the ethnic composition of this region that you can see in these maps. Uh, and on the, north, on the uh, top map, you can see the Transdanubian mountains mapped in the 1930s. So the German ethnicities. So they were subject to German colonialism and were approached to strengthen their national identity. Now against this, there was a, uh, in the interwar era, already in the interwar era, there was a discourse and practices of preserving the Hungarian race and national identity, especially after the trauma of 1920, of losing two thirds of the Hungarian kingdom territory, in which the Germans became a colonial threat. Just as previously the Hungarians were in the former uh, monarchy, the Hungarian kingdom. So uh, this conflict resulted in the ex uh, in Germans being expelled after World War II in the shadow of the Holocaust. Now, why this is really interesting is because this showed the inherently colonial biopolitics of modern nationalism, which was interlinked with overseas colonial peripheries which became destinations to solving European racial and ethnic issues, and also uh, various semi-peripheral structural problems like out-migration and remittances. So uh, uh, the, even the Hungarian, even the Austro-Hungarian monarchy was largely stabilized through remittance networks. But it was also about solving the Jewish question. Uh, and paradoxically, also this Jewish search for homeland in the colonies. So not just in Palestine uh, or Israel, but in various parts of Africa and also in Latin America and Australia and other parts of the world. And also we could, so one, the first trope I'd like to talk about is colonial escapism, which, uh, which is, has a very long history. So one, one important uh, uh, node was the 1848 independence wars in Hungary, uh, trajectories to refound the new Hungarian Republic in the colonies, for example, in the USA, so applying for colonies to start it over again. There was also a theater play by Paul Bekis in 1993 about this story, which you could see, but also books of various historians here uh, of Ach, Tivadar Ach. Now, this is also linked to a very important movie I, I like uh, so much, Nova Lituania, uh, uh, directed by Karolis Koknis. And uh, this is about Lithuanian escapism. It's a semi-fictitious film, which was nominated for the Oscar by the Lithuanians, by the way. It's about the geography in 1938, making plans to evacuate Lithuania as a low density country under existential threat from Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and even Poland. And here you could see this geographer making colonial comparisons of Africa with Lithuania on the basis of low population density, uh, which makes it prone to colonization. So you could see these shifting positions of who's the colonizer and who's the colonized, which is a recurring uh, issue in Jewish plans for uh, colonialism, for uh, establishing a homeland in the colonies, which was also used against them by these various racial states especially the German uh, empire. Now this becomes even more complicated if you look at the, the, the fact that the, the Swabian German Hungarians were colonists settling in Latin America at the same period, already in the interwar era. era. So Hungarians migrated to Latin America following uh, largely, uh, so there was a new wave migrating to Latin America following the immigration restrictions in the USA in the 1920s, which is mostly about keeping, about keeping out Eastern Europeans, the new immigrants, which was threatening the WASP racial uh, uh, visions of the USA, white USA. Now, mostly these, uh, this is Jarago do Sul in Southern Brazil, which was founded by, established by Swabi and German Hungarians. Now there were various Hungarian colonies established, uh, mostly they came, 80% of them uh, came from post Trianon, so the detached territories. You can see on this advertisement. The, Zoltan, 
I have to stop you because uh, you either covered your microphone or something happened because we cannot hear you anymore. Okay, try again. Yes, this is good. But uh, is it good now? Yeah, throughout the presentation, there were some cracks. Uh, it was like, okay. I don't know. Just Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank okay. You. So turning back, there were Hungarian colonists, not just the Swabian Hungarians, but Hungarians in general. Most of them came from the detached post Trianon territories, as you can see on this advertisement and this map on the right by a shipping company. Uh, they were named after Hungarian names, the Colonia Arpad, Colonia Betlen, uh, Bodogasson Falva, etc. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to map these colonies, by the way, if you're interested, uh, uh, which were populated mostly by Hungarians. This is so important, the uh, flocking to the Americas, emigrating to the Americas, that this uh, sunk into Hungarian folklore. So there's a colony folklore. This is an example of a folk song. If I go to if I go to South America, buy a ticket to beautiful Hungary, a good ticket will have the price of a good fifty dollars. I will return my little angel to beautiful Hungary. It's very similar to the Afro-American blues songs, by the way, which are about the same topic of migrating to the north. Uh, and here you can see the the poor peasant. Uh, uh, traveler on the right, which is uh, developed in these stories, and also uh, the Hungarian Sekler, Transylvanian Sekler, which was a prime uh, figure of these traveling stories to the colonies. Uh, and also this, as I said, uh, the remittance networks were very important uh, uh, in uh, bourgeoisation in, in uh, these villages. And most of these people the German Swabians, which I mentioned, came from the Transdanubian Mountains, which I showed on the map, which was mapped by the uh, Nazi German geographers. Uh, okay. So the stakes were that there were various Hungarian actors and figures, uh, folk writers, aristocrat, colonizers, Jesuit missionaries, or even the state itself, which were trying to organize the Hungarian diet. Uh, with the vision of having a Hungarian colony within a racial state of uh, Argentina or Brazil or Paraguay, for example. So there were these competing uh, 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 colonial trajectories, uh, both by the Germans, of course, by the Hungarians and by the local racial states, the local racial states who wanted to populate the colonial frontiers with these poor Eastern Europeans. Uh, some folk writers, like Franz Kordash, wrote about this Hungarian colonist. What does a Hungarian colonist mean in this Colonia Hungara, the Hungarian colony? And it was strongly, this peripheral colonist was strongly connect, was connected to this uh, semi-peripheral position of being a minority in South uh, American racial states, and also of preserving of national survival, of how to preserve Hungarianness, how to bring Hungarian artifacts, plants, seeds, whatever, to develop this new Hungary. In, in the case of Jesuit missionaries, this was also about posing a semi-peripheral alternative against the Northern Protestant uh, 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 racial and colonial project of the USA. Uh, Bela Bonga and Zoltan Yistor, uh, 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 had this trajectory of a Catholic Southern uh, a colonial uh, imaginary world which Hungarians could develop on. Uh, okay, some visuals of these uh, 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 Hungarian uh, colonists, which I've gathered. There are uh, hundreds of photos, and also uh, I could show you links if you're interested. The idea is uh, that in terms of memory politics, what's really interesting is that this post socialist turn to the national diaspora especially because the diaspora is very nationalist because they try to, uh, 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 try to maintain their ident national identities. But on the other hand, this is kind of paradoxical because uh, through these repatriation programs, uh, that, uh, uh, this also results in creolizing Hungary. Because if you include these people into the Hungarian national history, then you could get this wider history of Hungarian colonies Hungarian colonists, who in many cases, not just intelligentsia or political refugees, but poor peasants and seasonal workers. And also uh, in Argentina and Brazil, there's uh, important memory politics. There's film, a documentary, 
a lot of books and research about sex trafficking, about sex trafficking of Jewish whites from Eastern Europe to these racial states uh, of Tzvi Migdal, this uh, sex trafficking organization which was run by Jews, for example. And there's complete silence in Hungary and Eastern Europe about the same histories and also Eastern European trajectories to organize sex trafficking. Uh, and last, my last example, which I wanted to include because of race and because of the, the Jewish history, which I tried to show, is the, the example of Ilish Kotzer, who was a Hungarian Jewish writer, act, very active in the interwar era. And since he was, he was a communist Zionist, and he had to flee from Transylvania, then Czechoslovakia, due to the Trianon Treaty, when these territories were uh, made into new countries and uh, detached from the Hungarian kingdom. So he wrote the first Negro novel, so-called Negro novel in 1936, after René Maran's Batuala in 1921, which, was, which is widely acclaimed as the first one, uh, against Hitler and against Nazism. It was also a treatise of Pan-Africanism. And in this, he uh, identified with, it's a story but with the Negro, so the black uh, African, uh, uh, from West Africa who went to Europe, to Paris, met with the Pan-Africanist movement, and then went to the US where ultimately uh, the, the, the hero was lynched. So that's why you have this uh, book cover on the, on the left. So it's uh, in this case, why this is really important is not just uh, this paradoxity of essentializing racial culture and tradition to develop an anti-colonial and anti-racial resistance, which he as a Jewish writer did in his work. And in this case, turned towards French African negritudes, traditions and Pan-Africanist traditions to do the same. But also as a Zionist, he later emigrated to Israel in 1959 as a white Eastern European colonist. Uh, and he wrote this book, uh, which was previously published in a series in New uh, East uh, uh, Jewish Journal, The Dream Colonist. So again, uh, what's interesting, and this is the last sentence about this case, is the socialist memory politics. In socialist memory politics, other Jewish communists were remembered as anti-fascist heroes, but due to his Zionism, he was forgot, this writer was forgotten because the social state was in solidarity with Palestine and against Israel colonial state. Is, uh, and this is just to give you an idea, is uh, what we tried to do with F.S. Stockhart in the Transnational Zoltan, we, can, we can't hear you again. Trans peripheral traces of uh, trans, uh, trans peripheral traces uh, which we looked at in the trans periphery movement is also linked, was also linked to uh, this concept of transcoloniality. So what does coloniality mean in transit, which transgresses these accepted boundaries and also the boundaries of national histories and also how colonialities translate into each other. Uh, and as you can see how these various people or figures, actors were uh, subjected to various colonial projects and how these transforms our uh, mainstream ideas of global colonial history from an Eastern European uh, position. And how this uh, brings us a new history of not looking or focusing at the West, uh, but of a movement connecting across, translating between colonies, which would uh, show us a global colonial history of Eastern Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zoltan, for these very important inputs uh, that complicate things uh, a bit more now for us. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, uh, Lukács, uh, the, the floor is yours now. Please uh, introduce us to, to your work, uh, to how you see socialist world making uh, through architectural practice. Um, thank you. Um... I will share my screen and I think I will actually switch off my camera because my uh, internet connection is not very good, if that's okay. Um, so, all right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, um, for this invitation. I'm, I'm really um, happy to be part of this uh, conversation. 
uh, yesterday and today. And so what I'm going to uh, talk about is um, a concept that uh, was introduced in my last book, uh, which is called Architecture and Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and the Middle East and the Cold War. And I'm going to go to some extent beyond that book uh, uh, by, uh, by developing this concept a little bit further. Um, so the book uh, discusses several instances of collaboration. If you like, that's the most important word here. A collaboration between what was called at the time the second and the third worlds. It shows how during the Cold War, architects, planners, and construction companies from socialist Eastern Europe collaborated with the counterparts in West Africa and uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere. And the five chapters of the book discuss how this collaboration shaped and in many ways continues to shape um, five cities uh, in Africa and Asia, namely Accra, Lagos, Baghdad, Abu Dhabi, and Kuwait City. And so my argument today is this. Uh, what I want to uh, really show or talk about is that the global dimension was really crucial for this collaboration. And uh, that the various ways of practicing the world not only conditioned the possibility of such uh, collaboration, but also its character and its impact, sometimes long-lasting. Uh, and I, I want to conceptualize this global dimension by, by means of the concept of world making, by which I mean historically specific ways of practicing the world. Uh, I want to argue that the architectural exchanges between Eastern Europe, Africa, and Asia during decolonization and, and in the course of the Cold War can be usefully understood by means of the concept of socialist uh, world making. Uh, so the multiple and evolving exchanges between the socialist and post colonial countries, which were informed by diverse and often antagonistic visions of, of what, what the world was. Now, uh, the global dimension of architecture and urbanization processes during the Cold War is not a, a new topic. Uh, until uh, recently, the centralized and uh, more broadly in urban studies by means of two approaches, uh, I, I believe. One of them can be called um, global cities research, and the other one uh, can be called post colonial urbanism. Global cities res uh, research was largely based on world systems theory. By dividing the capitalist world economy into centers, semi peripheries, and peripheries, this research classified uh, world city regions according quote, to the mode of integration with the world economy. Uh, unquote. And this was, this was a quote from an influential paper by uh, Friedman and Wall from 1982. However, during the last two decades or so, urban scholars, among them Ananya Roy and Jennifer Robinson, have shown that cities can be global in many other ways. For a city to be global does not uh, simply mean it being a node within the global capitalist economy. These scholars found allies in various strands of post-colonial urbanism uh, or studies of the consequences of the colonial encounter for the production representation and lived experiences of spaces. Further impulses came from studies of racialized capitalism and feminist and queer geographies, in particular in uh, subaltern contexts. Um, global studies research and uh, post-colonial urbanism conceptualized uh, worldwide urbanization through global mobilities and connections, which originated through from two intertwined historical processes. On the one hand, uh, European colonialism followed by uh, decolonization, on the other, uh, Western-dominated globalization. And in, in, in recent years, scholars, including scholars who, who have been participating in this event, um, have shown that socialist Eastern Europe engaged into extensive exchanges with the decolonizing global South. Uh, Eastern Europeans also participated, although in an uneven and, lim and, and liminal manner, in the globalization, of process, globalization processes since the 1970s. Where arguably, these exchanges uh, have had a significant impact on architecture and uh, urbanization in a range of locations. However, 
I believe that this impact cannot be fully accounted for within this uh, conceptual ne network of, of, uh, of conceptual framework rather of global cities research and of post-colonial urbanism. And uh, it is here when I want to introduce the concept of socialist world making, because it was really uh, for me when, when writing that, that last book, uh, it was a really a helpful tool to understand these processes. And uh, while, while doing this and while, while thinking about uh, world making, I was inspired by, by a number of authors, including Adam Getachew. But my reading um, of the concepts of world making starts with really the historical materialist writings about the mondialization uh, by the French sociologist and, and Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre. Neither a simple translation of the English globalization nor a simple alternative to it, uh, Lefebvre's mondialization pointed at the world as a historically specific dimension of social practices. And American plan of these uh, practices. Lefebvre discussed writing in the 70s, 1970s. Lefebvre discussed mondialization as central to the urbanization processes around the planet and argued that practices of space production were informed by alternative imaginations of the world. And so I'm sure many of you know some kind of key Lefebvian concepts, for instance, such as the right to the city. And I, I, I think that, that for him, that concept of the right to the city was very much uh, uh, develop from within that planetary imagination. Uh, and so uh, the concept of mondialization helps advance uh, recent debates on the worlding of cities, drawing attention to uh, multiple visions and imaginations and experiences of the world and the ways in which uh, neg negotiations, conflicts, and sometimes synergies between uh, these visions inform urbanization processes in specific locations. Now, uh, Lefebvre's concepts uh, can be usefully confronted with those of the Martinican writer and scholar Edouard Glisson, who has been already mentioned by, by Manuela earlier today. And in particular, Glisson's concept of mondialité. Writing during and after the Cold War, Glisson reflected about the world beyond this expansionist concept. So the expansionist concepts inherited uh, from the colonial period. Rather, he reconceptualized the historical dimension when, and I quote, the thrust of the world and its desire no longer embolden you onward in a fever of discovery, they multiply you all around. Starting with a study of Antillean literature, Glisson theorized the ways in which worlds were assembled under the pressure of uh, political and economic violence stemming from the colonial period, from the plantation system, and uh, from more recent ones. And so building upon uh, Lefebvre and Glisson, I understand world making as a dimension of social practices that refer to values competing and normative visions of worldwide exchange and collaboration. Uh, they are worldwide in the sense that they encompass the whole planet or more modestly, uh, that they are not restricted to uh, specific places. World making may be practiced in incommensurable and yet uh, uh, intertwined ways. In Glisson's analysis, some global visions uh, come with the claim to universality. They are, in his writings, uh, these claims are conveyed uh, uh, by uh, such kind of distinctively Cold War era, era uh, statements of worldwide uh, uh, commercial market and universal defense of freedom and proletariat's final role and permanent uh, revolution. These are, these are quotes from, from Glisson's writings. However, he contrasted uh, these, uh, these universalisms with subaltern ways of conceiving and practicing the world, notably in post-colonial and uh, in colonial contexts. Um, these are informed by fragmentation, rather by claims to coherence, by constant reinvention and renewal, rather and by rather than by transparency. And so, and you know, to come to an end, uh, I want to say that the perspective of world making uh, helped me to address the complexity of the uh, Cold War architectural exchanges. And that included uh, both exchanges between the socialists and the 
uh, newly independent countries, but also uh, the ways how socialists were making interfered, interacted uh, uh, with uh, other world making practices, notably those originated uh, in, in uh, let's say, the global West. And the concept of the world making uh, really structures my book, Architect and Global Socialism. Each of the chapter uh, is intended as a reinterpretation and perhaps development of this concept. And so after the introductory chapter, the second chapter focuses on uh, Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah, the city of Accra, where, where I am now. Uh, in the early 1960s, Ghana was really one of the key places for the Soviets to promote the socialist model of development. And in this chapter, I'm, I'm, I'm studying the ways in which modern architecture in Accra was co-produced by Ghanaians and foreigners who tapped into those competing uh, networks of, uh, of uh, architectural resources, networks which in themselves uh, were informed by competing visions of worldwide uh, co cooperation. And then the next chapter focuses on Nigeria in the 1970s, a country which uh, was not at all socialist. Uh, Nigerian elites uh, and, and governments were generally hostile towards socialism, and that they invited uh, Eastern Europeans because of other reasons, notably, uh, you know, to stimulate competition, to, to fill shortages of uh, professional labor, and so on. And that is important because that, you know, resulted, uh, I believe, in a different type of world-making practices. Uh, Eastern Europeans working in Nigeria could not you know, claim global socialism, but uh, rather they sought for other ways to make sense uh, of the task at, send, at, at, at hand. They, they uh, imagined uh, worlds which they shared with Africans. And, and from these imaginations, they started to, you know, uh, uh, make sense. So to start to make sure that what they are, they are doing makes sense. And so uh, they, they uh, in this chapter, I'm, I'm showing how they started from those longer, analogies or speculative analogies and affinities between Eastern Europe and Africa during uh, or since the long 19th century. They claim that the foreign domination over Eastern Europe, over West Africa, uh, were, were in some way similar and in particular it had similar effects uh, such as let's say economic backwardness or, or cultural dependencies in, in both regions. Uh, what, what is really important is that I don't see these arguments as a question of legitimization of the work of Eastern Europeans in Nigeria, but rather I'm trying to find out uh, uh, and discuss the ways in which uh, these speculative affinities uh, were or resulted or allowed for tapping into architectural techniques from Eastern European architectural culture. Techniques which, to begin with, responded to these predicaments ostensibly shared by um, Eastern Europe and Nigeria. And uh, 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 I think uh, uh, interventions shows, shows, if you like, the uses of these historical analogies, but they also shows the limits of these uh, analogies and the racialized dynamics that informed socialist uh, world making. And in that dynamics reverberate that, that, that what, what Zoltan was just talking about, namely uh, these ambiguities of uh, Eastern Europe's own colonial history. And the next uh, chapter sort of replaces that, 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 that bottom-up perspective from Nigeria to you know, very different type of perspective, namely uh, one uh, of international trade and, and world making uh, tries to think world, think world making from that perspective by means of specific uh, features of political economy of state uh, socialism. And the chapter focuses on Baghdad and uh, it shows, it tries to show how Iraqi and Eastern European architects instrumentalize the differences between an emerging global market of design and construction services and the political economy of state socialism. Uh, such as you know, the inconvertibility of Eastern European currencies, such a specific type of labor contracts and employment contracts, which are quite complex, uh, uh, as they were issued by foreign trade organizations in Eastern Europe and Socialist Europe, uh, and also the principles of Balkan or Petrobalkan. Uh, and um, uh, 
I argue in the chapter that these specific techniques had actually an impact on not only uh, design procedures and methodologies, but also on the technopolitics and materialities that resulted from these exchanges. And finally, the last chapter discusses several buildings in the Gulf in Kuwait City and, and in uh, Abu Dhabi by Bulgarians and Eastern Europeans during the final decade of the Cold War. Uh, and, and again, here the dynamics is quite different. Uh, if you like, the, the least socialist at the, at the, at the first glance, because uh, the, this chapter shows how Bulgarian and other uh, Eastern European state uh, enterprises try to become integrated into by then Western dominated market of design and construction services in the Gulf. But I argue that they were able to do so, at least they had a chance to do so, because of the previous experience of two, of two decades or even longer in the region within the networks of uh, socialist internationalism. And in, in that sense, this is a chapter which re, which re inscribes socialist international, social, global socialism into the genealogy of uh, globalization. And I wanted to finish with this image, which was taken a few uh, days ago in Kumasi, in the Ashanti region in Ghana. And, uh, uh, we were privileged to, to be able to interview Professor John Ousu Addo, architect of uh, some of the most important buildings, uh, modernist buildings in Kumasi, age 94. And uh, in this conversation, he recalled uh, his cooperation with Yugoslav and particular Croatian architects uh, um, and you know, specific decisions on the working drawings of a number of buildings in, in Kumasi. After six Recall of his collaborator, Nero Marashevich, whom, whom he visited in Yugoslavia. And this conversation reminded me of a number of things. It, it reminded me of the fact that uh, the personal and the professional are deeply intertwined in socialist world making. But it also reminded me of the fragility of socialist uh, world making as architects from socialist countries really began to disappear from Kumasi and from Ghana uh, in the wake of the 1966 coup. Uh, and and um, I, I believe that that was a both short moment and a very memorable moment. Um, and I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas, so much uh, for this very exciting presentation. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussion and uh, possible maybe intersections with uh, what uh, previous speakers were telling, especially thinking about uh, um, what Tarna was talking about uh, in the in the previous uh, uh, session. Um, Erin, are you uh, with us? <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, so the floor is yours. Please, uh, I, I'm very excited to hear uh, about your approach to uh, decoloniality and uh, um, this uh, technologization global in global terms but especially from the perspective of Eastern Europe. Great. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Anna. And um, I'm really excited about the work that was just presented by both Zoltan and Lukash. And I'm excited to, to dive into your, your books. Um, and I actually think my presentation is, it, it will in some ways build upon some of what was talked about already. So I think it's, it's a good organization of panelists. Um, I'm going to just screen my, share my screen. Okay. Um, so yeah, in my presentation, I want to talk about this concept um, that I'm calling techno imperialism. Um, and it's, um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing research uh, based upon a time that I was living in uh, Romania in 2017 and 18. Um, and that I will begin. Um, so I wanted to actually start with a moment. Oops, here we go. Um, in 2018, oops, when uh, the mayor of Cluj in Romania um, announced the introduction of a public robot named Antonia as part of the city's newfound status as the Silicon Valley of Europe. Um, and although Antonia proved only to be a computer al algorithm, um, 
lacking the sort of robotic stock image displayed in the press, as you can see here. She, of course, it's a she uh, doing this work um, as the pu first public mayoral servant was nevertheless conjured as part of a widespread techno futurist smart city vision reflected in the new um, Romanian infrastructure and imaginaries uh, surrounding this uh, vision of becoming siliconized or becoming this new um, Silicon Valley of Eastern Europe. Um, and today, one only has to momentarily peruse Cluj's neighborhoods, for instance, Marasht, to breathe in new construction particles and observe fiber optic cabling sticking out of buildings like alien tentacles waiting to be connected. New condos and co-working spaces materialize overnight while former industrial socialist factories are being transformed into office spaces for outsourcing. And I can remember at the time um, sitting in the front yard of the anarchist feminist social center of Casa, surrounded by old fruit trees and a bountiful garden, feeling like the property itself was out of joint against newly erected development closing in on the city center with the Japanese-based NTT Data Company, um, which is now the city's tallest building, uh, flashing its colossal sign above the silicon siliconizing horizon. Um, and across the streets, or, or across the city, rents uh, were beginning to rise and evictions too. Numerous poor and working class people, especially Roma residents, are being squeezed out, sometimes ending up homeless, sometimes banished from the city altogether. In some ways, the techno-urban gentrification of Cluj can be traced back to 2010, when the Finnish tech company, Nokia, re relocated one of their German uh, factories to the city, to Cluj. And while jobs were temporarily created and a manufacturing plant went up um, outside of the city center, and temporary only because Nokia then decided to relocate to China where it received better tax breaks. Um, but anyway, a factory was set up uh, and an office building was supposed to be erected downtown. Um, but this coupled with a mess of neoliberal urban, urban planning decisions um, led to the violent forced eviction of over 350 people uh, who had been living there in the middle of a freezing December night. Most evictees comprising 76 families were then expelled to subhuman conditions in the city's wayside Pada Root, where a decade later, many are still fighting for the right to return to the city center and to social housing. Um, but you know, Nokia's office was never built, and instead a series of other buildings were erected upon the ruins of dispossession, a faculty of orthodox theology for the university, a public nursery called the Wizard of Oz, and then a 12-story premium apartment building with 120 parking spaces. And so while much of this is entangled in the transformation of property in post-socialist contexts, in which pre-socialist pri private property regimes are being restituted and where um, the descendants of uh, pre-socialist property owners are being uh, granted back buildings um, that had become socialized during socialism, um, which is a process that I know both Anna and Beda, who will speak after me, have produced a lot of important research and activism around. So well, this is a, an important framework to understand what's happening here. Um, so is this process that I'm, I'm calling uh, techno-imperialism, I argue. Um, and by this, um, I mean the modes through which Western and increasingly Silicon Valley materialities and imaginaries transform post-social post-socialist spatiality, desires, and futures. And by imaginaries here, um, I want to note the frictions and fictions um, caught up in a sort of aspirational politic um, that we can trace back to post-enlightenment visions of Western recognition and becoming. Um, and in other words, just like Antonia was never the actual astrofuturist site by robot displayed in the press, but rather an algorithm. Um, Techno-imperial aspirations of Western becoming and recognition are used to justify uh, local techno-urban projects, um, whether they are to make room for Silicon Valley companies themselves or a sort of siliconized mimicry. From the Wizard of Oz to the new uh, Oxygen Mall, which sits upon a former butchery that was known as the Red Flag uh, during socialism uh, when it opened in 1947. The toponymy of new development projects is overtly colonial in nature. 
Um, meanwhile, Western tech workers are showing up to work in and sometimes capitalize upon newly available outsourced labor in many of these buildings. Um, some of these tech workers identify as digital nomads. Um, and and I, that's an identity that I argue is indicative of a freedom fantasy um, long caught up in imperial desires. Um, and you can think about 19th century uh, romantic orientalist gypsy novellas in which um, deracinated Roma freedom was used as an allegory for, for Western European colonial expansion. And so um, part of my project questions, what does it mean that the sort of nomadic freedom fantasy of siliconization today um, continues to uh, dispossess Roma people? Um, but also might this index a new moment of imperiality in which the center of empire now also incorporates Silicon Valley or the imaginary of Silicon Valley. Um, but what I want to go back to here is that these freedom fantasies, uh, very dispossessive freedom fantasies, take place upon the ruins of socialist era factories and infrastructure and knowledge. Um, and so during socialism, um, as was already discussed, um, in part, the state excelled at um, uh, industrial development and particularly um, I want to think about hardware development and manufacturing. Um, today, the German iQuest building, which is you know producing uh, software through outsourced labor, um, sits upon the ruins of the Flockadera textile factory adjacent to where another German multinational Bosch is developing a new campus. Um, meanwhile, outsourcing branches of two U.S. Um, landlord technology companies, Yardi and Property Radar sit upon a former beer plant um, in a building now known as the office um, in English. And so what I wanna get at here is that unlike dominant imperial imaginaries that see Cluj's new turn towards becoming a smart city um, sit upon a sort of blank slate where there was you know, nothing technological going on and then the West came in to save the day. Um, but in fact, you know, we can see that a lot of these contemporary um, very exploitative tech projects are being built upon the very infrastructure of uh, socialist technological modernity. Um, and while I could go on about the socialist state and its projects of producing communist futurity through technology, um, some for better, some for worse, uh, what I find more interesting is that some of the most ingenious um, technological developments of the era actually occurred underground in apartment buildings, university computer labs, and more. Cyber development was you know, deeply entrenched within the socialist project above ground, uh, of course, too, with the country producing the most third generation computers in the Eastern Bloc, while also but it also fostered these really deviant practices of computer cloning underground. And by this, what would, I mean that people would um, get the sort of licenses from Western computers and build them themselves. Um, so the British computer uh, called the ZX Spectrum, which was produced in 1982, was soon copied throughout the Eastern Bloc, including in Romania, and became one of the most common computers, each one made individually by hand, um, in part because it was way too expensive to buy a computer. Um, and there were other models uh, created too in this manner, but basically hacking Western um, licenses and models to create something new. Um, and then you know, after 1989, uh, the land that socialist factories, computer, and otherwise sat upon was largely bought up by real estate speculators, divided into joint stock trades and sold, um, including the building of the Felix Computer Factory in Bucharest, which manufactured um, the state's computers after having cloned a French computer model. Um, but then IBM came in and bought it all up. And similarly, companies like Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, and Oracle swept in to buy up computer factories and uh, absorb IT workers, um, often embracing Cold War grammars of uh, socialist backwardness to, to justify Western technological salvation. And it's uh, notable, of course, that many of these Western, uh, especially US companies, um, specifically linked communism with illiberalism, authoritarianism, and unfreedom, um, and technological backwardness. And um, it was in 1989, as the Cold War was coming to a close, that Ronald Reagan proclaimed that the Goliath of totalitarianism 
would be brought down by the David of the microchip. Those were his words. So um, the idea again was that this new era in human history, as he put it, was about to bring about peace and freedom for all um, by essentially materializing techno-imperialism. So um, yeah, despite this violent process of co-opting socialist uh, factories, other uh, clandestine technological practices persisted, influenced by uh, DIY socialist uh, knowledge. And so there were practices like internet cabling um, between buildings to kind of create more independent um, internet networks um, and software and media piracy flourished. Um, again, in part because nobody could afford Western software, but through this um, in computer cafes and uh, in computer labs, at universities, and in people's buildings, um, people embrace what would be called speckeria uh, in, in Romanian, which is a Romanian word with Romani roots, inferring a sort of cunningness or street smart cleverness. Um, and yet a lot of these networks, independent networks, like you can see here, um, they too seem enough were co-opted and bought up by larger internet com companies. Um, although some still do persist and exist. And for a little while, I lived in a building where one of these was the main source of internet in the building. Um, but nevertheless, um, what I'm looking at here is how techno-imperialism has meant that the co-optation of both state computing and hardware production factories infrastructure, as well as uh, techno-deviant practices, not to mention uh, the cheap surrogate labor that outsourcing provides. Um, and if you fast forward to the last several years, we see smart city projects recode these Cold War fantasies. Um, but as we've seen through histories of coloniality, empire works through the colonization of minds, desires, memories. And um, some of this gets at what the video that was talking about earlier in terms of intimate colonialism. Um, but what happens is that these anti capitalist understandings of technology also get wiped out, rebooted, and reprogrammed. Um, and yet, nevertheless, um, in underground cracks and crevices, some still do persist. Um, and as a retro computing expert uh, who's trying to establish a museum of underground computers, in Cluj explained to me once that, um, contrary to what a lot of people think, um, today's sort of tech boom in Cluj is not really being led by the West or by the companies but rather by a particular generation of people now in their mid thirties and early forties um, who uh, grew up by engaging in underground deviant technological practices. And it's these people who hold the knowledge that the outsourcing firms are trying to exploit and build upon. And while it's their parents' knowledge and work that um, the industrial, um, uh, their parents' industrial work that the firms themselves are, are co-opting and, and buying up. So, what I want to get at here is that while well, through techno imperialism, the West may absorb existing infrastructure and knowledge, um, it wasn't the West that created these. And so, in a sense, um, while techno imperialism co ops underground cyber worlds um, and instantiates new forms of gentrification, um, it remains materially corrupted by and essentially dependent upon um, underground technological knowledge. Um, so um, to wrap things up, um, unfortunately, again, given the, the powers of coloniality, um, not very many people consider the role of socialist and transitional technological knowledge um, as a site of potential resistance or decoloniality. Um, oops, wait, I think I skipped a sign. Yeah, okay. Um, instead we see, uh, Okay. Instead, we see populist anti-corruption movements such as the late revolution, which erupted in late 27 in Romania, um, galvanize contemporary Western technologies to prove proximity to and possibilities again of becoming Western. Um, but that said, there are nevertheless um, underground communal spaces where artists and technologists are finding new ways to reimagine and envision anti-capitalist and anti-imperial technological futures, um, many of which build upon a longer history of resistance, refusal, organizing, and deviancy. Um, and meanwhile, I would argue that even perhaps more importantly, there's ongoing 
uh, work, for instance, in Cluj, led by Social Housing Now, um, that is, is continuing to organize against uh, type gentrification and the sort of smart city becoming. Um, and what's important is that this work is being led uh, in part by those who have been addicted themselves in collaboration with organizers who have been building a crucial analysis um, around the violence of um, imperialism and, and capitalism. And um, I think what's yet to be determined is how technological housing and racial justice worlds can continue to come together to forge features um, anti radical to and against um, the powers of techno imperialism. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Erin. I think this was uh, like more than necessary, this perspective that, that you uh, brought in. And I really like the way uh, in which you, you connect this techno imperialism, but also like social justice work uh, and this uh, underground uh, work with technology. Um, Veda, uh, are you with us? We can't see you. Hello. Can you unmute yourself so we hear you as well? Yeah, I am here. Hi, uh, is uh, everything okay uh, with your uh, computer or phone or whatever you chose at the end to use? Yes, after Erin's presentation, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm a bit on the spot, you know, like uh, uh, the Romanian with the technology problem, you know. <laughs> no, but the situation is very specific. So, uh, it's very specific, yeah, very specific, so bear with me um yeah so um let me see if how so, so veda is uh, just uh, to let you know in the the european action coalition for right to housing in the city meeting and uh, i think she's in in children's rooms or something in a, like a bank bed <laughs> trying to figure out uh, how to uh, talk to us because she also has a damaged computer yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, in a nutshell. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm hosted by a comrade, and I am in their children's room. So this is why this looks a bit like a kindergarten or something. You know, also fitting for uh, someone from Romania. So it's all like it all kind of uh, makes sense. It, um, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna screen share. Ooh, here we go. Yeah. It works, right? No. No. Don't see your screen. Oh, oh, oh. Now there is something happening. Yeah, we can see your screen. <laughs> you made it. Um, great. You can make it full screen. Oh, great. Perfect. Excellent. So, so Veda, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, Anna, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited. Um, I'm uh, also uh, very grateful for uh, your uh, uh, introduction of me. Um, I'll just briefly just add that um, um, my interest with uh, decolonial thought um, has been um, ongoing for um, many years. And recently for just a few years, what I'm kind of super interested in um, or even solely interested in is how decolonial concepts can be actually um, transformed into uh, praxis within social movements. So this is kind of what, I'm, um, what I want to focus on um, how can we, uh, of course, bring the colonial thought um, in uh, the Eastern European context, but more specifically, how can we develop like um, co critical concepts, uh, frameworks, analytics um, that actually can be used actively by people involved in social movements? So how to make it really embodied, really uh, practical in a sense, 
so when I say how to make make uh, these concepts um, um, be used by by activists, I mean in the spaces of organizing, which are uh, you know meetings, creating um, um, campaigns, um, creating narratives of um, the analysis of uh, you know of of a situation like the diagnosis, then the strategies. Um, employed by organizations and uh, and movements, um, the way they relate to other um, social movements locally or internationally, and then also with Western ones. So all of this kind of all of this richness of spaces and contexts, I am interested in how to bring uh, uh, the colonial thought there in a way that uh, doesn't feel um like it's just another theoretical framework on top of everything that we already have and it just feels like something that is uh challenging to um um to put together uh and yeah it, it's just like another burden of criticality let's say um so uh yeah um so my proposal is um, is the concept of disavowal. Uh, now this is a work in progress, so I want to I want to work on this together with you. Um, uh, I'm proposing the concept of disavowal as a critical tool to understand the way coloniality distributes subjects into taking up uh, different roles or identities in the colonial matrix. So this is um, what I'm going for. Now, what is this avowal? If we look at the Cambridge Dictionary, it is uh, to say that you know nothing about something or that you have no responsibility for or connection with something. And what I want to stress here uh, are two key aspects, which are agency, right? Because with this avowal, it is the subject that refuses um, uh, association with something, um, so uh, agency, and then uh, the concept, the, the aspect of actual refusal, so uh, the, the distancing. And I just wanna point this out because I'll come back to these uh, later. And now I'm gonna go to this beautiful uh, pixelized uh, image, uh, just like, a <laughs> just another, um a uh, little observation is that because my computer um well broke in a very complex situation um i lost the material a lot of materials that i prepared for this presentation so this is why also some of the images are just you know stuff that uh, i could find um relatively fast so anyway um this is the trope of uh Tzaraka fara which means a country like outside. And this placard says, I want a country like outside. So this is like a trope in Romanian society. You find it all over the place. There is like a pop band that made a, a, a song that's called like that. It's like, it's one of the favorite, like, um, you know, like a liberal kind of ish um, slogans uh, in protests. You find it everywhere. It's like a true trope in, in uh, uh, Romanian society, um, and what I what I I'm interesting to uh, interested to take from this is um, uh, the the understanding of the transitional aspect of how coloniality works in Eastern Europe. So, because I mean, we know we know that this is a key aspect, right? The transitionality, the transitional um, dimension. Um, and what is uh, how this translates in this uh, slogan is simply that there is, you know, um, the local country, the well, Romania, and then there is the other countries of outside, and there is always this desire to cross that border, to kind of become one, to be like that, to uh, be non differentiated from that outside, which is, I mean, it's Western, it's the West. Um, so uh, in these terms, the Eastern European subject is perpetually on its way to becoming European, Western and white. Um, 
uh, from the, the perspective of the West, the uh, Eastern European subject is always catching up, always trying to, to, um, to be at, at the level. And from the Eastern European perspective, it is about aspiration. It, it is about the desire to go uh, to, to reach that level, right? And um, I know one of my notes here in my, uh, in my presentation says it struggles so hard. So this is the uh, Eastern European, well, at least, uh, well, I mean, referring to the Romanian context subject that, uh, you know, it struggles really, really, really hard to become, to become Western. And um, for also Erin's delight, I'm also, uh, um, uh, I also have a lot of images from, uh, from the light revolution which is something that we talked about extensively. And we, uh, you know, we, we um, very cringely uh, attended. The Light Revolution uh, are these uh, massive protests that happened in 2017. They're the anti-corruption um, protests. Um, and um, they were self-titled uh, the Light Revolution. Now, this is again the trope of country, uh, I need a country, I want a country like outside. And this you can see, it, it has been canceled. The desire, the, the, the struggle, right, um, to become like that has been canceled by, um, here is the Dragnia, this politician from um, the PSD, the Social Democrat Party, which is considered rightfully so, uh, somewhat a continuation of the communist uh, party, of the historical communist party. Um, now, in the light, Revo the light revolution was all about being, showing that uh, um, Romanian, um, the Romanian society is European. You say here, you see here, um, um, you know, uh, uh, European Union um, flags were adorned everywhere. EU, we love you, was um, um, projected uh, with these like gigantic um, devices on uh, on buildings. This is also something that uh, is linked, of course, with what Erin uh, um, was talking about technology. Um, so you see also this with, uh, you know, it's like. Uh, Europe, European Union here, like, you know, this is like the, the light revolution was supposed to embody the spirit of the European Union and of Europeanness. Um, yeah, and so um, just to a bit to, to, to dwell a bit on this, um, this is a, a key kind of the light revolution was a key a manifestation of um western aspiration and desire this yearning to be western uh, yearning to be civilized um uh to be part of that family um of white um civilizations now uh, the core a core component of this desire is the disavowal of identities subjectivities cultures mentalities etc which do not fit the civilizational power matrix of the white Self. Now, the race for deorientalization, right? So, uh, of uh, um, um, differentiating from everything that is not Western. Um, so, the race for deorientalization has been since 18th century a continuous process in the never to be achieved establishment of white European Romania. Throughout modern history, in the Romanian context, um, the Roma, the Jewish, the Turks, the Russian have all played a uh, very diverse, so they're not, uh, they're not equated, very diverse functions of this otherness. Um, and this otherness keeps, is what keeps Romania, Romanian identity uh, so-called back. So in this narrative, it, keep, it keeps it back from achieving uh, the European Western civilizational status and especially whiteness. 
Now, uh, with the, the light revolution, corruption is equated with communism, is equated with backwardness. Um, now, another um, interesting thing about the, um, the light revolution, I mean, I can talk about this for, for many hours because I'm really, it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating topic. Um, was this kind of, uh, as you see in this image, these, this type of assembly, assemblage of, uh, assemblage of, uh, I've been to many assemblies in the past days, so <laughs> instead of assemblage, anyway, so this is uh, assemblage of um, uh, national um, symbols, right? So we have the German flag <laughs> and uh, the US flag, uh, the Romanian flag, of course, there's also somewhere also the EU flag. Um, and uh, very nicely in this corner here um, uh, on, on the left side, you can see this uh, little paper that says fear of the dark. So this is all, you know, it's like this imaginary Western aspirational imaginary. Um, so to see people wearing national flags at these liberal pro-Western uh, uh, protests is not a paradox, but the continuation of the liberal patriotism championed by the self-proclaimed dissident intelligentsia of the 1980s, who saw themselves as the true representatives of who and what the nation is. In this climate, the deep blue flag of the European Union is brought to the square as a symbol of cleansing. Um, uh, yeah, and so then we have this uh, really beautiful image and I'm putting them together, which is um, uh, the Romanian flag created with uh, lights from the phone, uh, from, you know, from, from smartphones and also the European flag also um, created like this. Um, And here I wanna, I wanna uh, touch upon the false antagonism of nationalism versus Europeanization, um, liberal uh, imaginary versus uh, traditionalist imaginary, um, that kind of like all of that pa paradigm. Now, this is an antagonism that has structured Romanian history and society and intellectual debates. And I know that this is very common to other societies in the region. Um, uh, I think it is key for us as decolonial scholars and whatever we call ourselves, uh, decolonial something, uh, thinkers to really show uh, that uh, the false antagonism of this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just so you, yeah. This is best done, so revealing that the, this dichotomy is a false antagonism is best done through decolonial thought, because decolonial thought shows us best that local nationalism is one of the main tools of Western modernity, and its main purpose is not to resist Westernization, but quite the opposite, to uh, incorporate and assimilate societies into the global flows of capitalism. Now, destructuring the anti-modern um, and uh, liberal narrative versus liberal narrative um, is uh, is quite essential um, into I, I believe uh, creating a, a decolonial strategy. Um, great. So next, this is a poster um, I made for. Uh, uh, this project I had. So this is some, we're, we're going so, to something different now, a bit different. Um, in 2017 and 2018, uh, together uh, with Mircea Nicolae, uh, we created this project called the History Does Not Repeat Itself. I'll just mention it briefly. Um, and it's a speculative history project in which we developed together with activists, artists, journalists, uh, workers, etc. Um, uh, we developed uh, several, uh, around 10 alternative history uh, stories uh, of uh, the 90s and 2000s, but especially the 90s. And one of this, uh, one of the speculative history is the creation 
of uh, the free union of uh, workers from Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, in this project, the way we have, uh, the way we chose to exhibit um, this project is that we created artifacts, artifacts of these histories. So we created banners, texts, uh, posters, all kinds of objects that create, um, that would give materiality to this, uh, to this, these speculations. And so this is one of these uh, objects. And as you can see, uh, the flag says, Nuvrem Tsara Kafara, we do not want um, a, a country like outside, a country like the West, because obviously here the West is represented as uh, fascism. So, um, and this is kind of like what I'm, what I'm getting to um, now, is, and that is, critical disavowal, right? So th this is how uh, we wanna like go about um, uh, with the concept of disavowal now, and that is a uh, refusal of, uh, in, of, um, of cooptation um, into Western becoming. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so then, um, just developing on this idea of disavowal of Western becoming as a critical concept and as a useful concept uh, for, for us. Um, um, I want to return to those key aspects that I mentioned at, at the beginning, which are um, agency and refusal. So refusal, I, I um, uh, refusal here just to a bit develop even more is refusal of being a participant and accomplice to all ongoing imperialist colonial processes. And uh, because um, the concept of disavowal includes agency, we wanna look at this process of, uh, uh, of these, uh, uh, we wanna look at co these colonial processes as a co-creation or co-production. So, so there is a responsibility on the side of uh, this Eastern European subject. Um, there is a responsibility, there is complicity in reproducing violence and exploitation. And of course, when we say this, uh, the, the complicity to, um, to Western colonialism, and we, we know, uh, fortunately, the, my colleagues of, the, uh, of this panel have also like, touched upon this, what I want to just briefly mention, and this is very connected with this image, is that the chief, um, the chief um, um, complicity to this uh, that I, I believe to be uh, so the most important is, uh, of course, the history of Roma slavery and uh, the involvement of Romanian society and the regime in the Roma and Jewish Holocaust. Now this image uh, is actually from a protest uh, in um, 2021. So uh, at the height of the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests, the ones with the um, hmm, no, I think it was this was 2020. Sorry, sorry, I'm a bit uh, <laughs> um, so um, at the height, uh, yes, at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, there was this, uh, this, this the direction of, um, of bringing down statues, which was really amazing. And uh, we also uh, uh, tried to contribute to that uh, in, in the Romanian context. So this is a protest that was done in 2020. Um, it is a protest uh, of, um, of a group organized of, um, um, Roma activists and non-Roma activists that uh, work together for uh, for many years in different kind of contexts, and you can see here the big banner of Black Lives Matter, and then Polizia Ucide, which means police kills, which is one of uh, it, it's one it's a key uh, slogan for the uh, feminist and anti-racist movement uh, recent in the last years. Then up. You can see racismo ne sufoco, which is uh, racism is um, 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 suffocating us, right? But then um, solidaritate interseccionale, intersectional solidarity, 
and Opere Roma. Um, so all of these, um, all of these uh, slogans, and this is like a small action, obviously, but it's really important because this was in the height of the of the uh, uh, pandemic restrictions. So you you had there were like bans on uh, on any on, on everything. You couldn't make a protest, and we we actually this is in the city center, like really key location, and we literally like were uh, ch chased down the street by the police and we were kind of like this kind of like uh, cat and mouse type of situation so um it was a small action but like extremely um um yeah you know with uh with a lot of courage i would say um yeah so um so again um I want to underline that there should never be disavowal. So this this strategy of refusal um, without historical and contemporary responsibility, including being mindful of how white privilege works in contemporary racism and how it extends uh, on subject in subjects in Eastern Europe. Um, and just to I mean, of course, uh, also this is just briefly disavowal kind of links to I'm, I'm not kind of it links to Mignolo's delinking concept um but it's it's a, a bit different um now just uh how much do i have uh, a bit more time no not yeah you should wrap up if you can yeah yeah i'm wrapping up um so um a decolonial strategy um, focused on on uh, uh, on uh, disavowal, I would say, is a decolonial strategy that occupies the space all opened up when we manage to deconstruct uh, and destructure the false uh, um, uh, the false dichotomy, the false antagonism between so-called liberal, European, or, you know, civilizational paradigm and traditionalist, nationalist, um, and so on paradigm. So when we manage to deconstruct this dichotomy, a space opens up for us. And in that space, we can build this, uh, this strategy. Um, now, a few specific um, tactics that can be part of this are again this is in the context of uh, especially i'm thinking for uh, in the context of organizing and social movements and how activists are uh, building their um, strategies and discourses uh, and practices within uh, within uh, their uh, movements tactics like a critical analysis of liberal pro-western aspirational colonial tropes and discourses present in the movement so critical view on that showing that nationalism is just modernization with a different hat so not go into the into the trap of looking at nationalism as some sort of like backward uh, you know like uh, yeah backward uh, primitive uh, um, perspective and and position and political reading um, revealing the complicities between right-wing politicians, networks, and intellectuals with Western imperialism, including their material dependencies. Um, so kind of revealing their, um, 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 their hypocrisy. Renouncing liberal political vocabularies and the strict definition of the arsenal of resistance, uh, which says that you know only certain forms of resistance are understood as political, the ones that are Western created originated. Like you know, we, we political action is only a protest, a petition, and all of that. You know, like very strict arsenal. If it doesn't look like that, it's not political action. Uh, examine material histories of resource distribution and the state's um, complicity with racial histories. Uh, histories of racialized subjects and uh, their dispossession, continuous dispossession. Um, and, and then finally, which probably is the most important and exciting, 
which is unearthing histories of working class anti-fascist resistance and generally histories of popular resistance in front of exploitation and authoritarianism in guarding their memory. Now we know by now that one of the most efficient tools of epistemological mystification and dominance is obscuring the very existence of such histories, something that is very useful equally to the anti-liberal paradigm and the liberal westernizing one. And just to, um, and I'm now I'm ending just with a very, very interesting image, just to show just to, a bit to illustrate maybe a bit more what I'm, uh, what I, I'm imagining and what, you know, to some degree we all, we are already done, we're already doing. This is an image from uh, the Pride, uh, the Bucharest Pride in 2019. And uh, this is the Accenture block. So Accenture is a corporation and they formed a block in the pride as they do in, in, Western, um, in Western countries. And this is the IBM pride, uh, the IBM, sorry, block in the pride. Um, and the thing is, so from a liberal perspective, when we look at this, these images, we see, you know, coherence and we see what needs to be done, what needs to, to happen, right? Like the local subjects, you know, these are like civilized, uh, smart, uh, young, urban people. They have great jobs as these like fancy corporations. They are, uh, you know, civilized. They're like uh, cool. Uh, they're LGBT. Every, all of that is a package. And then when we look um, at these images from the perspective of um, anti-liberal, um, nationalist, traditionalist, et cetera, um, right-wing, uh, well, right-wing traditionalist perspective, we see um, uh, the, uh, well, you know, we see the uh, invasion of, uh, of local, of the local context, of local society, of main society, with uh, Western ideas that are not um, indigenous to um, to the local context, they are not specific to the local context. There are some, they are something foreign, etc. We know this. So these are right the two big um, um, paradigms in which, you know, generally. Uh, these, uh, these, um, this stuff is interpreted. What I'm proposing is um, showing that this is a, a, a false antagonism and uh, inside of that um, creates uh, uh, the possibility to refuse this kind of cooptation and refuse, um, refuse um, um, well, the, the re refuse the ongoing or perpetual transitional process of Western becoming. Thank you. Thank you, Veda, so much for this very important intervention. Um, I really like how uh, this uh, uh, panel or group of people uh, kind of went from this uh, very complex history of uh, uh, colonization and colonialism to uh, these complicated also relations between uh, um, socialist uh, um, ways uh, uh, of uh, world making uh, in the encounter with the uh, let's say post-colonial worlds uh, to this complex history of uh, 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 technology in in socialist times and uh, and today uh, and the, the this uh, grassroots uh, uh, reaction to to all of this uh, uh, very complicated history that we ended up uh, uh, in in reality. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you, Veda, so much. I, I think uh, I mean I can relate very much to what uh, you were. You were saying uh, the, the experience in Serbia is uh, in a way similar, and uh, for me, it's uh, specifically interested uh, uh, this uh, um, this issue of uh, connecting uh, uh, coloniality and uh, nationalism and how it came to be. I mean, it's, I mean, the, the case of Yugoslavia is particularly uh, uh, symptomatic, so to say. Uh, but also many uh, uh, 
let's say, post-colonial, the colonial theorist wrote about how colonialism produced uh, nations in, in colonial, in, the, in its colonies. So I, I think that there is also, there there is space for uh, doing some work. Um, for this group of people, I'm not offering a comfort break. I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, eight o'clock and 40 minutes. <laughs> so we go directly to discussion. <laughs> so Zoltan, um, you had the most of time to think about questions and how you want to um, intervene or do you want to expand on anything that uh, you previously said? I mean, I, uh, I can maybe uh, start with the question for you because uh, uh, at times connections was not very, very good. So I, for, for instance, uh, I heard somewhere in the beginning of your uh, talk that you uh, uh, kind of had a critical remark towards how people uh, address racism now in Eastern Europe, but I didn't very much understand what you were aiming for. Could you please clarify this for us? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, a big question to raise for everyone in all the four panels uh, and our presentations here is how these histories of coloniality, relations to anti-colonialism perhaps, or uh, decolonization inform our current struggles and what type of decolonism to do in Eastern Europe? And does it make a difference compared to what you have? Because as I tried to mention, most of the literature and also the political articulation. We can't hear you. Can you speak? Yes. Okay. It's better. Sorry. I don't know what's happened with the microphone. So I think this connects to uh, Veda's talk. If we think about activism, resistance, and how to articulate or frame uh, decolonialism in Eastern Europe, uh, I see a lot of flaws uh, and a lot of flaws also from the le left because they don't seem to understand the complicated colonial histories of Eastern Europe and how we first need to understand these histories. In my perspective, this is a semi-peripheral position, which makes things complicated or how to be in between, which is connected to what Manuela talked about and what Lukash talked about. What is this in-betweenness about uh, maneuvering globally? Uh, so uh, in terms of race, it's uh, really important to look into these histories because in my perspective, this whitening out of the region started in the 1980s with the global uh, debt crisis, which shattered all the re previous uh, anti-colonial, anti-racist solidarity relations with the third world, uh, Eastern Europeans and the third world. And after that, um, uh, there's much to, um, to return to, to understand what these previous solidarities meant and how this also concealed our previous uh, racial positioning of uh, becoming whites and being not quite whites, which is, for example, and this is what I will try to finish with, is um, even our government in Hungary, conservative and so-called liberal government is uh, sort of experimenting with different racial positions. So for example, this resurrection of Turanism, which means that uh, Hungarians are actually of Asian or Asiatic origin, is used in you know, connecting with, to the New Silk Road, to Chinese uh, governmental projects, and also to Central Asian investments. Uh, this is just one example, but also the uh, connections to Africa, uh, how Christianity is used as a connection, uh, but also this kind of uh, notion that we never had colonies, so we are the ones to you know, do business with is also an interesting way of global maneuvering. So I think we should rethink about these, his rethink these histories in light of how to inform current decolonial struggles. Thank you, Zoltan, so much. Uh, Lucas, would you be up for like uh, commenting or continuing this discussion? Uh, I mean, in this direction of uh, of uh, 
uh, trying to see like socialist world, world making through the prism of race, let's right, say, uh, on, on the basis of what you were doing. And yes, well, I'm also interested, like, what is the status of, uh, of this architecture that you were studying now? I mean, what's happening to these histories uh, at this historical moment uh, in these countries? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I will, I will, uh, maybe the last question I will answer last or, or maybe a little bit later, because I thought that uh, um, I want us to start perhaps with, if, if, if I may, a comment to um, Aaron's uh, presentation, which I thought very, very interesting. And um, when I was, when I, le when I um, heard this, when I heard you, when I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking about a different type of technology that was very successfully uh, exported from socialist Romania, uh, and namely housing. And so one of, one of uh, the, the topics I looked at in my work was, um, um, you know, there's huge volumes that were produced, uh, designed and constructed by Romanian actors, uh, design institutes and contractors, uh, notably uh, in the oil producing countries around the Mediterranean, uh, you know, Algeria, Libya, Syria, Iraq, in the, in the 70s and in the 80s. And again, uh, while Romania is, uh, I think it's fair to say, not very present in the history of our, you know, European architecture, actually when looked at from North, from you know, the Maghreb, from the Levant, from the Middle East, it was a major actor at that time. So I thought that, is, that change in perspective already is an interesting phenomenon in itself. But my point is this, so, so there was a very powerful technology being uh, exported uh, from, from uh, Socialist Romania uh, under Ceausescu. And that technology was um, also diverse. There was you know, some advanced, really advanced system like the prefabricated Brashov system. And on the other hand, there, was, uh, there were uh, systems which were sort of really flexible and adapted. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't actually romanticize these because all of all of these activities came with with a very significant exploitation, notably exploitation of the Romanian population and the architects and workers employed on this construction site. But you know, I was wondering, simply opening this up, what what does it mean in your in your conceptual framework? Is there uh, is there a socialist techno imperialism? Is, you know, I, I would be really curious to know. Um, what, what do you think about about this? Yeah, maybe I, I, I pause for the minute. Erin, would you like to answer this? Um, no, I think that's a really generative question and um, not one that I've done a lot of research around, um, but obviously you're, you're doing important research around it, so I almost want to hear more from you. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot to think about in terms of how um, ideas were exported from, from Romania during socialism um, and even how understandings of housing were also maybe influenced by what was going on in China. And so there, there, we really do need this um, transnational approach to understanding how ideas transit and travel and the exploitation of labor um, that, that requires of, of different workers. So I don't wanna um, claim to know that much about uh, the labor that was required to produce socialist housing outside of Romania by Romanian workers. But um, but I also had a question for you that maybe I could, I could turn back to you just really quickly. But in, in terms of thinking about um, what a sort of like post-socialist, maybe like urban studies approach would be to decolonization, I'm, I'm just interested to hear more because I think there's so much in urban studies, for instance, um, work being done to think about the epistemologies of post-colonial urbanism, really, really important work. And then post-socialism often just stands in as a geographic descriptor rather than a framework of, uh, of knowledge. So that was, yeah, that was my question for you. But. Yeah, I, I think that's very, very true. I think there is, uh, I think there is new research coming. Uh, there is new research which, uh, uh, I think is uh, the, the the place from which it stems is comparatistics. I would argue, you know, urban compar comparison, and I have quoted some people, some people who worked uh, who work on on on, on this in, in, in geography, and um, so I think that uh, uh, that 
comparison which uh, is no longer um, a comparison a comparison approach which does no longer claim that the only viable candidates for comparisons are you know the five cities in the in Western Europe and North America, but actually you know goes so far to say that everything can be compared with everything, everything can be juxtaposed, every city can be juxtaposed with any other city. And like, what does it mean? You know, what that kind of experimental comparatistics actually can mean for the understanding of the urbanization processes, both in terms of structures and infrastructure and policies, and in terms of uh, an actual practices of everyday life. I think a lot of, a lot of uh, unexpected uh, similarities, differences, stem from that that kind of uh, approach you know including to just to give one example the from from the city where i am the, where uh, the, there is this new um, extensive planning of uh, of a crowd huge ambitions uh, which which uh, have uh, the, the only precedent really of that ambition is socialist planning and then chroma uh, and and sometimes the projects very much kind of pick up on you know the designs pick up Scale, uh, but also uh, you know even on the on the programs, of course now with a really different type of sensitivity, and so I think that um, there are the I I would think that th these types of comparisons both across time, meaning you know between the socialist and the post-socialist period in, in this case in Ghana and across space uh, between Ghana and Eastern Europe, and, um, and I think th these these are the really generative. Uh, uh, places in urban studies today. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Veda, would you like to comment on anything or raise any issues, questions? Um, I was just thinking about what Zoltan was saying earlier about, um, as I understand from what he said, um, uh, this moment in the 80s of uh, uh, being pushed I mean, being distributed into whiteness. Um, well, I think this is like definitely a, a crucial moment as we've seen it also in the Romanian context. Um, I, in the Romanian context also, um, uh, anti-Roma racism has since, um, uh, I'm in, in the uh, actual history of Roma slavery has been shown to have um, a colorist uh, dimension. So um, this has been present for, for centuries. It was not the core component of that um, racism, but it was very, very important. So um, um, I would say, you know, whiteness um, here in the Romanian context and with this history is very, very, it's much more complicated to unpack. Um, yeah, just to mention this. Yeah. Zoltan. Uh, okay. Not sure uh, what to react to because we also had an incoming question and uh, which is about you know the Eastern European differences, because, and I mentioned Yugocentrism as a problem in this that the Yugoslavia Nam connection is often essentialized, not put in a wider global political economic context, which could include other Eastern European positions, and then look at you know perhaps comparisons in how which related to Nam or to decolonization struggles. But I also had a question to Lukas, which I think is a broader question, which harks back to or connects back to the uh, previous day's panels. So Lukas put in brackets socialist world making, whereas he talked about socialist uh, world making per se, uh, with making, you know, there were uh, modifications or local configurations. Uh, depending on what that meant in, in the Gulf, for example, or in the context of Nigeria. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the potential of the socialists. Uh, if we talk about current decolonization struggles, how does this socialist world making inform our current you know, politics or our current um, 
ways to understand that socialist word making as a formal way of decolonization in light of the fact that much of the socialist modernity was rather Eurocentric and in a way colonial. So what do you think of this? Um, Sultan, I think a bit of part of your question was cut off because of my connection. I, is, was that a question to me or was it a comment to me? Yeah, okay. Um, no, absolutely, I think that um, I, I, um, I definitely do think that this is a, um, a central point. And I also think that I would argue that as many people um, was, were saying yesterday and today, that Eastern Europe is a, is a hugely diverse uh, territory. And I think um, the, 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 the relationship to, to, coloniality, to, to colonization and then also to coloniality really differs from town country to country. And so I think that is something, this is something where, where these historical experiences that somehow you know, conditioned the perceptions by some of these Eastern Europeans uh, I looked at uh, also deferred between, you know, between uh, themselves. Um, and so I think that uh, there was definitely that, uh, that uh, um, aspect of domination or that hegemony, this is why I asked this question of, of uh, you know, whether, whether there was, uh, one could talk about technology or techno-imperialism in the case of uh, socialist countries, because, you know, there is archival evidence and I have, you know, very much seen it and not once where some of these foreign trade um, uh, agencies, these foreign trade companies, you know, explicitly pushed towards um, exchanges that would put some of these um, newly independent countries uh, into path dependencies, into technological path dependencies uh, with, uh, uh, with Eastern Europe. And so, or from Eastern Europe. And so th that was very evident, I think, but perhaps the, the more relevant question is how these uh, countries and actors from these countries responded and resisted these path dependencies, sometimes su successfully, sometimes less so. And I think that comes back in a way to the first question that you ask Sultan, you know, to what, to what extent, to what extent, um, you know, we can learn really anything from, <laughs> From these histories, and I, I and I agree with you that we can uh, learn a great deal. But what for me, what what was really the number one uh, observation, if not the lesson, was uh, that 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 positionality of Eastern Europeans. Again, not everybody, and not not to the same extent. But I think to to, to generalize the positionality of Eastern Europeans as weak actors, and I do think that that is consistent in a number of locations that I have looked at uh, and throughout also, you know, historically um, within the period uh, that, I, that I looked at. And, and, and so I think that the fact that they were, uh, you know, the, as, as, as I mentioned before, the fact that the engineer um, technologies uh, uh, to the local conditions is not because, uh, you know, they thought that 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 was the number one choice. That was because of the pressures on sites to which they yielded. Uh, and because they were acting from a position of, of, you know, relative weakness in comparison to a number of other actors that were that were on site. And so I think that if, you know, so basically my, my answer to you would be that if there is lesson to be learned is how you know, from from these histories is uh, you know how to how to uh, uh, recognize that uh, potentiality of weakness as a potentiality of not uh, as as a position you are forced into, but uh, rather as a as a position that. Uh, uh, can generate uh, you know new and progressive types of uh, collaboration. I'm trying to follow the chat, but it seems like the the chat has uh, like its own self sufficient discussion within the <laughs> within this field. Um, so maybe we just continue with the with rounds. Uh, Erin, would you like to comment on anything or add anything to this discussion? I mean, uh, everything what you said, Lucas is uh, uh, Lucas is very important. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, I I also think that we need more of this knowledge, and I would really much like now to ask you like all of these questions regarding like uh, these dialogues with people that you have actually there, and what are their impressions, memories, you know, like how they relate to to these times and their work. But maybe first I give word to to Erin, and then you can answer all of my questions. Um, yeah, maybe just to turn a little bit more towards uh, Tavetta's presentation. Um, I mean, I, I know I was there with you, and we uh, cringingly did go to the late revolution protests, and I, I've seen the the tech companies and the pride parades. Um, but yeah, I'd just love to hear you reflect more upon like how um, I think in these maybe in queer spaces, for instance. Um, the pushback against the sort of uh, tech uh, gentrification of pride um, and the sort of alliances that are being formed uh, to to kind of fight the imperiality of that like how you see that um continuing or to just talk a little bit more about what disavowal will make look like um, in the future as you imagine <laughs> based on all the organizing you're doing Yeah, well, it, it is um, complex to, 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 I mean, the, the answer is long, um, but definitely I think the, on, on a basic level, there needs to be a lot of like work on subjectivity. Like this is, I feel crucial, but then necessarily there also needs to be a material level. And this is like, of course, this is the classic or like the, the well known, um, issue of uh, the dependency of social movements in Eastern Europe by of um, dependency on uh, Western funds. And um, there is this, um, you know, this ongoing conversation on, okay, so we, yeah, of course, we want to be critical to, to the West and to Western cooptation and da da da, but we still have this level of of dependency and how can we, you know, how can we address that? So that is also part part of the issue. Um, and thinking materially about how to delink from uh, um, from from a dynamic that is um, hierarchical, that is asymmetrical. Um, it's also it's really really important. But again, like on the level of subjectivity, there is so much work to be done. And I feel like um, many times in, in the context of organizing, you feel like, um, okay, but you know, if we, if we are too critical with uh, certain aspects of uh, you know, Western um, thought um, and um, uh, Western thought in terms of um, um, organizing and resistance and that kind of um, um, uh, all, all, all of that. Um, if, if we do that, then what are we left with, you know? Because then we, uh, are we to, to simply like uh, look locally, but what if locally we don't have enough um, you know, enough uh, history to build upon. So there is this constant like, okay, uh, like um, kind of uh, a search of where are the references, where is the model and so on and so forth. But um, in these years of organizing, I feel like precisely that kind of um, uncertainty and, um, and uh, search, um, is actually really exciting. It's really, really, really exciting. And it creates, um, it, it actually can create, I feel, uh, a true historical consciousness in the sense that you don't really know how to um, entangle things, how to associate things, um, which are your models, what are you building on? But the fact that you are, um, still creating strategies and narratives of resistance, even in that uncertainty, gives you a, a somewhat um, feeling of uh, some sort of like a historical role. 
um, it feels like there is something very relevant ongoing in this uncertainty and in this continuous uh, uh, search for, um, um, in a sense, identity, but not really. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Veda. Zalta, do you want to add anything or? Yes, if you can hear me, of course. Yes, we can. Okay, this is actually, again, something to put quite broadly and connect all previous comments in the chat and what Lukash and Veda just talked about. Uh, I think there's a need to globalize dialogue. And Lukash's work also shows that this that socialist period, especially the 1960s, is very informative in showing how alternative networks could develop outside the West, and also shows how histories could be written without this West centrism, without necessarily looking at the West. And this is something which returned, especially after 1989. Uh, the, in the post-socialist era after the system change that this return to Europe also meant the re-embracing of uh, we love you, uh, in you, EU, we love you. Uh, the type of protest that Veda showed, the EU flags and all that kind of EU mania, the, um, this kind of a, uh, frustration, frustrated whiteness of becoming whites and of returning to Europe and being developed, being part of the core, totally neglected other alternatives and avenues of uh, also writing history and reflecting on our history, uh, but also in contemporary dialogues of, and this I'd like to connect to, because, to what Esther talked about yesterday because she also put this in the chat, agreeing with that we need more discussions with colleagues in the global South. She talked about independence and just think about the fact that if we're talking about artists, uh, creators, academics, cultural workers, why do we need independence through the West? So everybody's looking at the West, but why not develop you know, connections or alliances with Indians, with people in Ghana, so maybe they have more Western interests in today in developing these connections and putting together our uh, resources would be more uh, efficient perhaps. Uh, we might understand each other better because of our joint you know, frustrations with dependency, dependency on the West. So that's what I would close my you know, comments and discussion is that, uh, this we need more uh, a more global dialogue right and this kind of decolonizing eastern europe is not currently is very west centric and not currently framed in global dialogues yes yeah i, I was also thinking about uh, what uh, esther was saying uh, in this concept of independence because we all uh, uh, I don't know, like, say, let's say the beginning of our struggles kind of went into the space of culture because this was the space where, um, you know, independent thought was possible in the East because there was a lot of kind of resources that were put into that for different reasons that are very complex and I don't want to go into that now. But uh, I was also thinking how uh, at this point it's less about, the issue is less about independence uh, because the, the, previously it was like the, the issue of independence from the state, but now it's uh, about bare survival from what I'm seeing around me, you know, so people are, you know, like taking bits and pieces of money from everywhere just to be able to survive from the state, from the city, from this foundation, from European Union, wherever, you know, this money is offered just to be able you know, to, to survive in this, uh, in this situation that, that uh, um, I mean, is very complex and very specific in, let's say, Serbia and other ex-Yugoslav uh, ex uh, spaces. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it is still a relevant concept and uh, uh, I mean, I really like your suggestion, but the problem is where the money is today. I mean, you know, like we, we need to take it from, I mean, it's taken from us, we need to get it back, but uh, someone is holding the, the bank. 
Uh, anyway, uh, so if uh, uh, um, let me see what time is it. Okay, we have a little bit more time if you're still willing and not, you know, like falling asleep, uh, lost concentration and everything. So, Lucas, uh, if you uh, may, uh, I would really much like to hear uh, about these uh, conversations that you're having right now with people. Yes, just a very quick comment to what Zoltan says that I, I you know, I, I, I agree with, with, uh, uh, absolutely with with that fact that the focus on the 1960s in West Africa is uh, really shows the possi possibility of alternative connections but it but the focus on the 70s if you like shows the fragility too and I think and I of these connections and I think that is something which in a way um, I rediscover more and more how um, if, if you like these these structural relationships so, so easily can come back uh, and that's something uh, that that's a, that's a really strong experience of the life. and um, coming back to your question, Anna, and I think linking it to what Boyan were was saying on on um, were on on the chart, I, I think that these conversations are, are really crucial, uh, and uh, these conversations between Eastern Europe and and uh, the global South, and I think the the, the juxtaposition of the various uh, perspectives, uh, which I think really would, would allow us to change some of our very deeply ingrained preconceptions, for instance, about, about nationalism, for once. But the other one which I wanted to mention is, is and I think that's, that's something which, again, I have been thinking quite a lot in, in, in recent months, is really the question of race. And I think that this connection and these encounters uh, really show um, that uh, on number one, uh, race is incredibly important. And number two, that the way which in which we we think about race is sort of dominated by certain hegemonic concepts. And and I think um, uh, these encounters, these if you like east south encounters, really help to 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 go beyond some of these hegemonic con uh, concepts of, of race and, and preconceptions of race, which, uh, and, you know, conflicts of race and where, where, where are the lines of conflicts and, and where, where is the location of violence? So I think that uh, uh, it is, I, I believe, you know, as somebody who, as I mentioned before, I strongly believe in comparative methods. I think that these types of juxtaposition uh, uh, and these types of juxtaposition of perspectives uh, are really, really useful and it help us and help us, um, if you like, to 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 us as Eastern Europeans now, it helps us to um, perhaps go away from the sort of within and against type of dynamics that we have uh, with some of the some of the hegemonic centers of, of conceptual production, uh, and, and instead look at uh, concepts which might not be you know formulated uh, in the same way and might have you know the conceptual production might be uh, defined more you know in different ways more more through a historical development rather than you know, pinpointed in in normative uh, ways but nevertheless uh, that intellectual production and that conceptual production is definitely there and i think it comes very much to the fore in such encounters Thank you, Lucas. Um, I also wanted to comment on, on another thing and come back to Veda somehow and Erin's uh, presentations uh, um, and also connect to this, uh, again, notion of uh, independence. Uh, uh, I, and I remember from another talk that uh, Veda gave uh, um, with uh, Michele Lanchone uh, uh, about the, the concept of uh, doing under comments through like uh, activism, academia and so on, because this concept also comes from, let's say, a sort of like the colonial uh, uh, approach. And I, I think it might be useful, you know, to, to kind of like uh, try to think in, in this way uh, as well, like how we use all of these different resources, you know, to, to connect, uh, to create the, the um, the infrastructures and you know like spaces uh, and uh, you know like uh, dialogues uh, and practices that uh, are emancipatory in, in some sort of way yeah i can i can add something to this um more of a like a, in a more 
like a comical sense, but uh, not necessarily. I have this uh, small fantasy that um, someday there will be this very complex project in in um, Western uh, uh, networks of uh, you know leftist movements in which our Western comrades make it like one of their priority to, um, you know, take money, take resources from their Western context and redistribute them um, in, um, well, in Eastern Europe, but also other semi-peripheries and peripheries of the world. Like uh, this idea of like radical redistribution, but in terms of like from a decolonial perspective, not in the terms of, oh, you know, like I'm applying to Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung uh, and I have to write uh, a 10 page, uh, well, not 10 page, but like a 20 page report for 1000 euros, you know, that's not very, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, there's like so many different uh, fund funding, but um, most of it is quite humiliating, actually. And it always reaffirms this kind of asymmetrical position in which um, any kind of like organizing and to some degree art, uh, uh, the art context is, is very similar, uh, always you know, needs to like uh, reprove, you know, always needs to prove uh, themselves, always needs to deliver something to, to show that, you know, uh, we really do art or we really do activism, you know, and just give us some money, please. So um, I have this uh, fantasy that uh, this is some th in which there is this idea that this is some sort of a priority, you know, of like uh, stealing money, you know, from banks, the state, whatever, whatever, and uh, redistributing them. And just that, only that, you know, like that's like a, a project in itself. So um, I feel like, um, uh, you know, all jokes aside, but maybe not. Uh, redistribution redistribution is uh, is still I feel like the future and uh, the redistribution in terms of geopolitical um, categories in terms of uh, anti-imperialist anti-colonial decolonial uh, frameworks there is no other way really like I mean we have many ways to 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 get there I hope uh, you know I hope for the shortest but um, as I see it, there is no other uh, way um, around this, yeah. Okay, we also have a, a comment, I think it's from video. He says that the independent cultural sector have been very creative in our region and there are people who have created relations with the global south from the mid 1990s and 2000s with anti-racist groups and anti-war alliances with the global south too, but these positions have been repressed. Also, independent cultural workers have also committed class suicide, but without having the workers on their side. Uh, and then, Zoltan, do you want to, uh, uh, you know, like read your comment, or like, <laughs> or should I do it? Just very shortly connected to Veda, said, yeah, I've also been thinking of how to do um, knowledge production on a cooperative basis. So how, because in Hungary, we have lively initiatives of uh, um, community building based on cooperations and they are working, although the initial problem, of course, is that it's really much embedded in neoliberal capitalism. Uh, so they're prone to all the economic crisis and all the uh, economic pressures. Uh, and it's the same with academic knowledge production, which is very much neoliberal and competitive, but I'm very interested in uh, building these sort of um, uh, counter or anti-systemic alliances. And I just want to finish my comment with thinking about whether we should do this with, for example, Indian leftists and not with uh, German social Democrats. Just, just an idea. I like that to be very much. Erin, would you like to add anything to, to this discussion? Um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that and uh, Ovidio's comment too. And, um, and the work that people are doing to uh, 
think about the connections that have already historically existed between these places. And I think, I think just it's important in, in, in thinking about the internationalism of the socialist period and how it might um, continue to, to grow. Um, it's always important to think about, you know, how despite some of the best intentions, internal racism with, within Romania in this context was never, you know, adequately addressed. And, you know, there's still so much reparations to be done and to, um, in thinking about racial justice, not to only look outwards, but to then continue to look into the, the ongoing work uh, of, of reparations and uh, restorative justice that it needs to happen that, and that is happening. So I think sometimes, um, yeah, despite the fact that conditions, again, for Roma people really improved dramatically during socialism in comparison to pre-socialist conditions. And now there's this like restoration of that through restor restitution evictions um, and privatization and loss of employment and social provisions. Um, it's just important to not lose track of, of the ongoing work that is happening and needs to happen even more. So. Thank you, Erin, so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say that I'm very much impressed with how this group managed to, you know, like develop this uh, conversation to organize very, very different perspectives. I mean, there was so much, you know, like care and uh, uh, so much uh, uh, like of these best efforts that, you know, like people who are engaged with such topics as, uh, you know, the ones that we, we are doing uh, can, you know, like, uh, uh, kind of like give from themselves so yeah thank you all so much i am very impressed and i'm very happy that uh, uh, we are actually at the end came back to this issue of let's say infrastructure or whatever independent infrastructure because it, it is something that connects all of us uh, in a way i mean lucas you're also looking at this kind of infrastructural projects that kind of like traveled uh, uh, and you also made an effort to look at them uh, through the lens of technology which is also you know it was it appeared like uh, very logical but i never thought uh, uh, about housing as a, as a technology and uh, you know i really appreciate uh, 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 this angle and veda you also brought this uh, like uh, very important uh, um, uh, grassroots perspective uh, uh, around thinking about this avowal and how actually we do things, how we organize, and somehow, you know, like everything connected in this conversation. And I don't know, I just want to um, thank you for this. And I really hope that we will have a chance to continue this uh, conversation. I mean, we will definitely stay in touch uh, regarding the publication, uh, but I really hope that we will somehow find a way to 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 continue working on this uh, beyond that. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank, thanks so much. Thank, many thanks Thank to so much. everybody. Have a great rest of the evening, everyone.